Oh, it's that bit of ice I can see on the windscreen. They're going to skim and resurface this road. Hot, hot, hot. Okay, I'm going to go because um, there's some Herberts putting up no entry signs on my road. knows if I'll be able to get back in. I've got a bit of ice on the windscreen. So I'm just going to wait until that's melted. So anyway, how are you? <laughs> I'm going to do the back windscreen as well. Oh, it's one of those days when everything's filthy. That's it. All gone now. Oh, it's annoying because on this one, the windscreen wipers on the right, and if you push it up, it goes faster. And on the Suzuki, it's also on the right, and if you push it down, it goes faster. So they haven't standardised, have they? The French and the Japanese. Even the uh, direct the sides and the directions of the controls. So I've got a mental day today. Mental. <coughs> <coughs> We're literally double booked, <coughs> and the emergency slot's booked up, and I haven't even got to work yet. And I've got another emergency that's got a sharp tooth that's going to need to come in. So now, fortunately. Even on our mental days, we, uh, you know, we still have quite a long appointment. So, for example, I've still got 45 minutes for checkups and that. And we all know, you and I both know, I can do a checkup in five minutes. However, it's preferable not to. We've had a lot of work coming lately, which has caused a lot of problems because. You know the old mantra that you can, you know, if you get what you want, exactly what you want, then price is not a problem. But if you're not getting what you want, then you, you don't want it, even if it's free. And so we're getting to a stage where now, where we're irritating a lot of the patients because we can't give them the treatment that they want when they want it. And they don't, they're not really thinking, oh, that's good, I'm not, I can't get an appointment, but at least it's cheap. We might be better off like literally almost doubling the fees and saying, yeah, okay, we've lost half the patients, but you can get an appointment when you want, and they'll be saying, oh, that's great, because I've got exactly what I want when I want, and um, um, you know, I'm not, don't worry too much that it's expensive to go there, because they do give you what you want. So I think we might do a bit of both. Well, the thing about dentistry is you're always worrying about whether things are going to go slack, you know? Even if in the face of uh, the overwhelming evidence that you're getting busier and busier, uh, this comes back from the old days of uh, fee for item, when you used to earn money for every filling, and uh, if you didn't have anyone booked in, you weren't earning any money. <coughs> Although, <coughs> in the private sector, that is still the case, obviously. In the private sector, we still earn fee for item. Um, although there is a bit of... Um, third-party cavitation income coming in but although I'm really really booked up now I'm thinking oh when I buy Easter time perhaps I'll be really really slack and <clears throat> we have had examples that our local cafe for example put their prices up a lot and then had to put them down again in the 90s I uh, <clears throat> did a private conversion had to go back on the NHS you know you have to choose these times you, know, you have to wait until the real grinding force of uh, of uh, destiny forces you to do stuff uh, 
rather than sort of try and jump ahead of destiny, sometimes you're jumping off um, the edge of a cliff. Oh, this corner's difficult because in the morning, especially in the winter, the sun's right down. And uh, so you're blinded as you go up this particular stretch of road. So what I was going to talk about today, funnily enough, is giving up gracefully. Because um, multi-talented as I am, <coughs> I don't win everything. And um, I thought I'd share a couple of episodes with you where I took on a fight that I lost. And uh, how I cope with it, really. Or how I rationalise it, let's put it that way. And you'll notice straight away that I don't mind saying that I lost. Um, you know, you can't win every fight. And uh, some, you know, some you win, some you don't, as they say. Uh, I mean, I'm pleased to say most I won. But um, one of the biggest uh, losses, I think, was uh, when I was running the GDPA, as it, or the DPA, Dental Fusion, as it later became, we were lobbying on behalf of uh, terms and conditions for dentists in general practice. And uh, I always say we were the military wing of the BDA. And this, this uh, sort of line of thought occurred to me because I went to this uh, dentist dinner at Goodnestone Park recently and, uh, you know, they're all going on about, oh, do you go to the BDA meetings or do you go to the postgraduate meetings? And I said, I, I'm quite you know, clear about, no, I don't go to any of that, um, which is why I don't meet a lot of dentists, you know, it's quite nice to meet dentists, but in a social, in a social thing, in a context that wasn't the BDA, and the BDA really is just uh, social and clinical, and they uh, claim to uh, campaign hard on terms and conditions, but they don't, they basically, they let the Department of Health do what it likes, without any push, any pushback, and in return, they are uh, recognised as the sole negotiator, you know, the sole. <laughs> so, and it's an arrangement that works very well for uh, the VDA, and it's an arrangement that works very well for the department, but it doesn't work so well for VDA members um, whose terms and conditions are uh, a lot worse than they, they could be or should be, or the patients whose uh, treatment is... Um, a lot worse than it, than it could be and <clears throat> I'll come back to that later but with regards to running the GDPA the um, when I took over the GDPA it was taken sort of uh, quite seriously you know and we were invited along with the BDA to all sorts of uh, meetings and then uh, the Department of Health and to, to a lesser extent the BDA um, come to the conclusion that the best way to deal with the GDPA was to sort of freeze us out of everything. Um, and it's a very effective uh, technique. It's called shunning. And particular ethnic groups use shunning quite a lot and uh, because it works for them, getting offended and shunning. And, uh, and in the end, it worked quite well with us because um, when your association is not invited to anything, uh, when your association is... Uh, you know, not listed on websites, uh, list membership organisations, and your your uh, your association is not listed. And you realise it's because um, there's a lot of pressure on people not to do business with you. You know, a lot of pressure on people not to go out for lunch with you, not to meet you. Um, otherwise, they're uh, they're uh, to them far more valuable contacts within the BDA would. Were, were, are going to be uh, compromised, then um, you know you you have got a big problem there. Now, I, having worked for the GDPA since the late seventies, right the way through through to about two two thousand and fourteen, whatever, whenever it closed up, um, felt that I'd put my time in. You know, <laughs> I'd done forty years for the GDPA, and so. Uh, there comes a time when you have to say, I'm going to move on, uh, you know, and I'm going to do something else with my life. And 
particularly if what you're doing is seems to be uh, less appreciated and less popular than it was and in the case of the GDPA you know as we were vanished as we were erased from existence um, and then other webs other other ways of expressing their opinion came along like there was uh, uh, other online groups uh, were, were, were sort of came to the fore where people could express their discontent online and but all they were doing really was effectively was letting off steam so but but the you know generation Z or generation X I suppose as it was felt that it was sufficient to uh, just do a thumbs up or a thumbs down on something and then that that was their way of protesting the um, the baby boomers of which I have sort of more closely identify knew that to effect real change you needed to take real action and that involved a, a real physical presence in a real physical place and real physical money to fund real physical events and uh, but the, the new generation they were like you know they would never do they would never pay for anything that they could get for free so they wouldn't pay for a word processor if they could get a free word processor and they wouldn't pay for anything if they could they're used to just having everything uh, given to them because uh, we turned from a world where products were products into the people who use the products being the product and so by uh, you know allowing other people to monitor your patterns uh, of activity and get market insights and, and sell you advertising, targeted advertising and stuff, you then uh, were given free use of all sorts of stuff. And what they wanted was they wanted a group of like-minded people, which they could assemble very quickly on the internet, to all um, whinge uh, about a particular issue. And it could be quite a, a very narrow issue, like a particular pay rise or a particular G uh, Annual, annual retention fee rise or something and these groups would form quickly they would whinge a lot they would be a lot of uh, clicking thumbs up or thumbs down and then and then they would all sort of dissipate again so really they were just like an expression of dissatisfaction they weren't really agents for change well if you're in the business of running an association that does charge a real world membership fee and uh, does do things like lobby MPs and go along to the House of Commons and, and uh, un un write papers and make representations to the Doctors and Dentists Review Body and things like that, then um, you're very quickly going to get strangled. You know, we're getting strangled on one side by the government and we're getting one strangled on the other side by, uh, by the members. So I sort of, in the end, I just decided, you know, I did give the best part of my life to this association. I could, I could retire honourably and say, you know, if anyone said to me, you know, you didn't uh, achieve anything or, which is not true, I mean, we did achieve things. But if anyone said, oh, you didn't achieve anything or that you hadn't tried hard enough, I could I'd put my hand on my heart and say, look, <clears throat> If we didn't achieve anything, then we couldn't have tried any harder, you know. There's nothing that we didn't do that we could have done. And it's not like we didn't try for long enough. I did it for 40 years, you know. So it was, um, <clears throat> it's time to hand over to the next generation and say, look, okay, you know, you're still whinging about terms and conditions and uh, you're, uh, so let's see what ideas you've got, you know, let's see you change the world. Um, and, uh, and I've just gone back to um, <clears throat> the sort of defensive dentistry I do in my own practice, you know, which is basically just practicing dentistry in a way that I know will is, is in accordance with market conditions and not don't try and fight the prevailing wind, you know, don't try and bend the rules and work on the NHS just do <coughs> provide good quality dentistry, <coughs> make money and have fun. And that's working for me. You know, it's worked for me very well. Now, 
what d- did annoy me at that uh, Good Stone Park thing was that um, you know so many people were still like, oh yeah, d- oh, you remember the beat? Yeah, yeah. They were very good. You know, they helped me. I had a, a, a problem with one of my staff, and it was nice to be able to ring someone up and have a chat with them and uh, and uh, get it sorted. You know, and so <clears throat> so. The BDA sort of in, in uh, you know, and uh, providing uh, that sort of membership services are, are offering something that dentists value. But what they do is they, they are, in supporting the BDA, they are also supporting an, an association that is not pretty well leaves their terms and conditions to blow in the wind, you know. Not like the British Medical Association, which has a very strong base of support and when the BMA's on the phone to the Department of Health, they bloody quake, they're shaking. Uh, but the BDA's on the phone to the government, the, they're like, who, who the fuck cares, you know? <laughs> because the BDA, a long, long ago, made it quite clear that, uh, given the choice between taking a tough stance on behalf of their members or uh, going along with uh, the government line and and relying on the membership income they get from being a social and clinical and employment advice organization they're gonna they're gonna choose the latter so I'd just like to say to any of you if you're watching this and you're BDA members then you're the authors of your own downfall okay you are because the BDA does not negotiate on terms and conditions for dentists uh, uh, we basically we just get what we're given by the Department of Health and the BDA smiles because the last thing you know, in that that threat that the BDA used to out you know to pretty well um, make the GDPA untenable is the same threat that the government uses on the BDA and basically they say look you know if you don't just rubber stamp everything we do then what we're going to start thinking seriously about recognizing another organization that does and the BDA is like, oh, okay, okay, you know, okay, very good. And, you know, we lost a lot of money, we lost a lot of trade union funding that we should have done because the department and the BDA just conspired to make sure that we uh, we didn't get it. So, so that was it. So, you know, and since then I've had a few people, um, there's one prominent journalist who said, oh, Derek, it's, uh, you know, this is happening. Don't, aren't you going to do something about it? And I'm like, no, I'm not really in that business anymore, you know. Let the, the dentists who are affected by it sort it out. If something affects my surgery, then I'll I'll do something about it. But I have a large amount of autonomy and freedom in my surgery. It's a private practice, you know. We're, we're entirely free of all the NHS shenanigans. So I'm, I'm not prepared to stick up for people who won't stick up for themselves. That's what it boils down to. And... Um, you know, there's a, uh, another guy, a very nice guy, a barrister we used to work with. And he was like, oh, Derek's not the same, you know. You're, all these things are going on and you know, we need someone to act as a figurehead to fight against this, fight against that. And um, I'm very happy to say no. But I, I don't mind, you know, the fact that it didn't end well, the fact that it ended with the GDPA or the dental fusion, whatever it was called, being wound up was not, uh, was a loss, you know, it was a loss. I still think it was a loss to the profession. Uh, and I think the profession should have supported it more. But the profession didn't agree with me. <laughs> no, the profession did not think that they should have supported it more. Uh, the profession thought that they would uh, join a Facebook group or, uh, or some sort of other um, online community instead. And uh, that's so, and that's fine. And I respect that. You know, if your market, in so far as it is a market, you know, people who want uh, better terms and conditions for dentistry, if, if that's a market, and then there's no, uh, if that market dries up, and by by that I mean the people who are prepared to say contribute two hundred pound a year or something to an association that does uh, fight for their terms and conditions, that market dried up. And so, fair enough. You know, now. Now, the outcome of that was that, obviously, we've got the situation that we've got, which is the NHS dentistry pretty much collapsed. 
because it was always on a knife edge and then COVID has, has caused it to collapse by driving a coach and horses through the medical and the uh, clinical and the financial models that they relied on, which were never really robust in the first place. Um, and, you know, and I can, or I mean, it may be arrogant of me, but I can draw a link between the GDPA packing up, me packing up, and the service just going to pot. And, you know, to a certain extent, the only satisfaction I've got is that they have, they've ended up with the system that they were going to have, that they never really wanted, but were always going to get, because they were too stupid to realise that that was what, that's, that was the monster that Frankenstein created. So I don't mind, uh, you know, I can look back and say, you know, if I'd been chief dental officer, things would have gone very differently, you know. But that's that's something that I'll just have to wait until I'm in an old age home, you know, I'm in a residential care, and then I'll spend my life telling people that um, things would have been so much different, you know, if I'd been made prime minister, whatever. Now, the other example is my uh, surgery. I used to run a... For 20 years of my life, from about 84 to about 20, 2004, I uh, operated a lovely little practice in uh, Tankerton on the North Kent coast. <clears throat> and um, I started it from nothing. It was nothing. There, there was a. It was a butcher's, funnily enough, before, and uh, I installed the surgery from scratch. And in those days, you could. You just got a performance. Not it's called a performance number now, but it used to be just like a right to the dental practice board and tell them that you qualified, and they gave you a, a claim number, and uh, you uh, started putting forms in and making money. And and it took a while. It took a year or two, but we built it up. After 20 years, it was very successful. And then we tried to, uh, my brother qualified as a dentist, and together we wanted to work together in Canterbury, which was a much larger population center. Now, the reason why we wanted to work in Canterbury was because in Whitstable, it was very quiet. And there, there was enough, you know, but there was, you know, we, we weren't making a fortune. And um, it was mainly elderly people and uh, elderly people are not particularly wealthy people. Some of them were, but most of them were just, uh, you know, uh, you know, that needed new dentures, but they didn't want new dentures because they wanted to keep their money in case something happened. And, and so uh, as a result, we decided to sell the Tankerton practice. Now, we got it all the way through. This is very common to uh, exchange of contracts and everything. And then the day before the, uh, contracts were due to exchange the buyers came, invented an excuse not to buy knowing that at this very late stage it would be very inconvenient to us and that we might possibly um, uh, offer off you know accept less money now what happened in the actual what actually happened was that um, we decided just to shut the surgery down and not and not sell it and just sell it as a freehold unit and in fact, the guy who bought it was um, uh, turned it into a residential accommodation. So uh, we didn't benefit. We, we benefited from the sale of the freehold, but we didn't benefit from the sale of the goodwill. Well, blow me, like six months later or a year later, one of the other shops in the parade, there were three shops in the parade, we were the one on the right-hand side of the three. The, the one on the left-hand side of the three, which had been a, a confectioner's, um, turned out turned into a dental surgery. And uh, this dental surgery was uh, the people who would who were going to buy our dental surgery uh, decided to buy this other property. And so it then became a bit clearer that um, what they decided was that rather than pay us for our goodwill. Because they knew we were moving, that we, we had to close the surgery down because we were moving to Canterbury, that um, they figured it would be better if they just set up a surgery right next door and then 
and then they could effectively they'd get all the goodwill and uh, wouldn't have to pay us for it and that's what caused them to uh, ask for a you know for a, a massive reduction in the price uh, and it was a nuisance because it, there was a you know my brother and I jointly owned it and we, uh, we th there was a big fuss about you know what how we should handle it and what we should do anyway um caused a lot of trouble that's what I'm trying to say anyway my, uh, my I had to you know and that was a loss in a way because we'd lost the sale of the practice we'd lost the sale of the goodwill and uh, you know it all gone it all gone pretty badly and yet you know I thought to myself okay well I mean I was going to sell the practice to those people and Okay, it fell through, but if they, if they said to me, uh, we are about to set up next door, would you recommend that we do that? I would probably say no. I would probably say no, because I'd done it, you know, I'd done it 20 years previous, and I'd spent 20 years trying to make that surgery work, and while I would, I'm quite happy to, I would have been quite happy to have sold that practice to someone on the basis of sort of caveat emptor. If someone, even someone I didn't know, came to me and said, "Is that a good place to set up a surgery? Would you, would you recommend that we set up a surgery in that spot?" I probably would have said no. I would look elsewhere, you know, because that's what we, I decided, in the end that there was the potential wasn't there and so these buyers went through the whole process of negotiating the sale of the freehold the, uh, the change of use uh, in terms of the, the rates the uh, installation of the uh, purchase and installation of the surgery equipment from new whereas you know we just we just slung all this surgery equipment out of one end of the block and they were carrying it in through the other end of the block. And I just sat there and I thought, okay, you know, you're right, so you've done it. And you probably think you've done it a bit cheaper and a bit better and you think that you're gonna get all our patients, which, you know, perhaps you might do, I don't know. But what you've just done is you've just condemned yourself to spending 20 years doing what I've just finished doing, spending 20 years doing which is working probably in the wrong place. So, so, I don't know, you know, if you're, we, we, you know, that was something else that went badly, but in, in, these people, you know, they, they think that we snatched defeat out of the jaws of victory. Whereas in fact, I think they just marched into the jaws of defeat thinking that they were marching into the jaws of victory. Um, do you want to go? Yeah. So, you know, be careful what you wish for because you're, in some cases, you know, you'll think you've won the battle, but you're, you're, um, you're going to lose the war because you've lost sight. You've lost sight of, uh, uh, the goal, you know, you kept, took your eyes off the prize. But I've always wanted to go back to that surgery in Tankton and say, how's it going, you know. I spent 20 years, two doors up, and uh, you've spent 20 years there now, probably two doors down. What's it like, you know, how you getting on? Onwards and upwards. So. We have to watch out for these kids because there's not. Whoever did this school, then you put the uh, footpath on the one side. So that's um, that's about uh, how to lose fights gracefully. Big, big fights, you know. 
many, many years of my life, 40 years as a dental politician, 20 years as a, as a dentist in Tankerton. Lovely. All right. Nice to talk to you. See you soon. Bye.